Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Civil and Environmental Engineering CEI Committee's monthly seminar event. And today we are featuring our own Professor Ann Jeffers. Um, the title of Ann's talk is Lessons on Mental Health from a Professor with Mental Illness. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Anne. Her research focuses on fire safety engineering, finite element analysis, and computational methods. Um, she's earned a number of awards, including the prestigious National Science Foundation Career Award in 2013, as well as the Harry C. Biddlestone Award, also in 2013, for a paper published in Fire Technology. Anne is an advocate for mental health and seeks to bring knowledge and awareness to the general community about what it's like to live with mental illness and she's exploring this extensively in her writing. Her forthcoming memoir, Can You Hear the Music? A memoir about mental illness in the academy, describes her experience being diagnosed with and recovering from bipolar disorder and PTSD. Um, Anne is also leading a DEI committee task force on addressing mental health challenges in CEE. Um, so for those of you who are in our department, please keep your eye out for a survey that will be coming in approximately a month time frame, so we can get a sense for challenges in our own department and make recommendations for improvements. Um, a couple of logistics. So if you're on Zoom, um, please, uh, anytime you have questions, please type them into the chat and I'll be monitoring the chat. And I will then read your question to Anne during the Q&A. And also at the time of the Q&A, we will turn off the recording. So the talk portion will be recorded and then we'll turn it off when we switch to the session. Okay, and with that, I would like to welcome Anne and thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Alyssa, for the introduction. Um, thank you, everybody who's here in the room. It's nice to see people in person. Um, I was afraid I was going to be giving a talk to a big empty room. Um, so it's really nice to see your faces, especially on such a rainy uh, fall day. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to talk about mental health today. Um, it's something that we don't talk about enough. And even though it is um, uh, you know, not talked about, it's a very serious problem and it's very widespread throughout the university community. Um, I want to make sure that you understand that I'm speaking as a person with lived experience of mental illness. I am not a mental health professional. I also want to say that I'm going to share some of my journey with you. Um, about my own experiences with mental illness. And it may be difficult for some of you to hear some of these things. And so feel free to step away from the presentation at any time if you feel that you need to. In this presentation, what I want to do is I want to normalize the conversation around mental health. In addition, I want students who are struggling with mental illness to know that they're not alone. I also hope to give students some strategies and resources for improving their own mental health. And then I'll give you a glimpse of some of the initiatives that are going on here at the University of Michigan, um, some of which I'm involved in. Note that a lot of my talk focuses on grad student mental health. Um, I try to touch on some things that are relevant to students at all levels, as well as I know that there's a number of faculty in the room uh, and some staff as well. So hopefully everybody's able to get something out of this presentation. I don't think anyone here would disagree that college is tough. The stress of academics is high, and most students are learning to live on their own for the first time in their lives. In terms of mental health, it's also important to note that the age of onset for most mental illnesses is the age of 24 or earlier. Lipson et al. surveyed more than 150,000 students from nearly 200 college campuses. And they found that 27% uh, of those students screened positive for depression. Other studies have shown that anxiety may be even more prevalent than depression. Now, I want to point out that this statistic represents just a snapshot in time. It does not say that 27% of all students have clinical depression. What it says is that at the time that the survey was conducted, 27% of the respondents had symptoms that you know, were indicative of, of depression. Oh, 
There it is. Yeah, not a problem. Okay, um, so where were we? Uh, so, so yeah, so not the 27% of the students have clinical depression, um, but this gives us just sort of a baseline, a sort of measurement to let us see sort of how prevalent it is. And you'll see on the next slide um, when we move to uh, grad student mental health. So if undergrad is tough, grad school is arguably even tougher. A 2014 report from the University of California at Berkeley found that nearly 50% of their PhD students and nearly 40% of their master's students could be classified as exceeding the, th the threshold for depression. Another study back in 2005 showed that 10% of their PhD students or of their graduate and professional students at University of California at Berkeley contemplated suicide in the preceding 12 months. The literature shows that as a PhD student moves through the, their degree, their mental health may worsen with mental health being at its lowest point during comprehensive exams. So whether you're an undergrad or a grad student, it's easy to get lost. The stress and the lack of support can be overwhelming and it can take a toll on your mental health. Even if you decide to get help, the solution is not straightforward. Mental health facilities are overwhelmed. The fact is that record numbers of college students are seeking treatment for depression and anxiety, but the schools can't keep up. Let me share a little bit about my story to provide some context. I have bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is a mood disorder that's characterized by highs and lows, which are called mania and depression. It is a chronic illness. It will never go away. I've had it since I was a teenager, but I wasn't diagnosed until I was in my 30s. In fact, I didn't seek any help for mental health issues until I was in grad school, and I had a negative experience with the counselor at the university, so I never went back. This slide shows you my timeline. I basically finished up my bachelor's degree from the University of Pittsburgh in 2004, and then I went straight to grad school at Virginia Tech. After earning my master's and my PhD, I became an assistant professor at the University of Michigan on the tenure track. I went through the process and eventually was granted tenure in 2015 and promoted to associate professor. If you look at this timeline, you don't see mental illness at all. This looks like the, the timeline of a very successful individual, but I would struggled at different periods throughout that process. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit more about that. For me, grad school was especially tough. Due to my untreated bipolar disorder, I experienced a lot of depression and suicidal thoughts. In addition, I was awkward socially. I didn't have any friends, and I basically locked myself in my house and lived and breathed my research. I wasn't happy, but I was successful. Then the shooting happened in 2007. An event of that magnitude will shake an entire community. I had trouble sleeping, and I fell into a very dark depression. I lay around my house all day, every day, and I couldn't work on my research. In addition, I self-medicated with alcohol. It was a bad situation. The only way that I came out of the depression was that I eventually became manic due to the bipolar disorder. Note that I wasn't sleeping and lack of sleep is a huge trigger for bipolar disorder. So by the end of the summer in 2007, I came up with the idea for a new finite element that formed the basis for my dissertation research. In 2009, I graduated and landed, landed a tenure track job at the University of Michigan. I walked away from Virginia Tech with a PhD, but I also had post-traumatic stress disorder from the shooting and other traumas. I struggled silently with my mental health for years. Fortunately, I had bursts of productivity in between long periods of depression. It was enough to land me tenure at the University of Michigan. So you may be wondering what led to my diagnosis of bipolar disorder after having the illness for so long. Well, as I was coming up for tenure, I was trying to conceive a child and I had to be treated for infertility. The medications and the stress sent my moods all over the map. It triggered a manic episode with symptoms of psychosis. Mainly, I saw and heard things that weren't real and I was severely paranoid all the time. I sought help first through the Faculty and Staff Counseling Center. Um, it, it was previously under a different name, but now it's under FASCO. 
Um, and then they referred me to a private practice and I was quickly diagnosed with bipolar disorder with psychotic features. Bipolar disorder with psychotic features. The diagnosis knocked the wind out of me. I kept beating myself up, calling myself a failure and putting myself down as crazy for having the symptoms of psychosis. It was a very difficult time. I began treatment, which involved medications and therapy. In addition, I had to learn how to live again. I was still very ill for nearly two years and my productivity tanked during that time. I continued to teach my classes and advising my students, but I struggled with my responsibilities. Nonetheless, I went to therapy, I took my medications, and I reached a point of stability. For the first time in my life, I reached a point of stability. It was amazing. During that time, um, when in these photos, you'll see me doing things that I enjoy. I spent time with my family. I traveled. We adopted a puppy. His name's Jasper Mustachio. Um, doing all these things that I enjoy and really just focusing on living and finding purpose in life again. I focused on myself until I got better. Note that even though I'm stable now, there's always the possibility for relapse. A relapse can be triggered by lack of sleep, by stress, even the weather. Having bipolar disorder, I have to constantly monitor my moods and report to a psychiatrist and a therapist. Nonetheless, I'm more resilient now than I've ever been, and I'm finally turning my attention back to my work. From my experience, I've become very sensitive to the mental health needs of others, and I'm now a huge mental health advocate, which is why I'm standing here today. From my story, you can see themes that are common among university students. So let's see what the literature has to say. So if we look at college students in general, the transition to the university occurs at a time when the individual is establishing their own identity, they're separating from their family, they're establishing new social connections um, and so forth. And at that same time, the brain is undergoing rapid development and it's exposed to a number of stressors, not just psychosocial stressors, but also possibly recreational drugs, alcohol, uh, sleep disruption and so forth. In addition, mental illnesses are likely to emerge during that time period. Right? Like I said early on, the age of onset for most mental illnesses is by the age of 24. So a lot of students who have mental illness are experiencing their first symptoms when they first come to college. Delayed and inadequate treatment can lead to complex disorders, school dropout, addiction, and self-harm. What about doctoral students? Well, poor mental health is very closely linked to isolation. Those of you who are in a PhD know how isolating a PhD can be. There are some protective factors. So having a positive relationship with your advisor can have a huge benefit in terms of your mental health. Also having a social support network, viewing the PhD as a process and engaging in self-care. If we look closer at social isolation, we can see that it's lack to not it's lack to it's due to the lack of having a strong support network. In addition, it's most common among non-native English speakers. It's also more common among those who have caregiving responsibilities. Um, again, there are some protective factors. So getting involved in student organizations, having a strong connection to your community can really benefit your mental health. This is a, uh, an image that I pulled from a paper by, well, it's an article by Woolston that was in Nature. Basically, in, in this article, they surveyed 6,000 or so uh, PhD students, and they asked them, how many hours are you working? And the overwhelming response was that 76% of PhD students were working more than 41 hours per week. So, if you're wondering, am I working too much, too little? It's the, the work conditions are not clear and students often find that as a huge source of stress. In addition, student advisor relationships are critical in the PhD. Positive student advisor relationships act as a buffer against stressors. 
it's interesting that this uh, study that was done by Davis, that what they did was they uh, interviewed PhD students and they said, what are the characteristics of an ideal supervisor? And you'll see things like constructively critical, focused, highly motivated, caring, empathetic, encouraging, approachable, friendly, flexible, conscientious, enthusiastic, reliable, passionate. Okay, these are all have nothing to do with the field of expertise, right? It's these personal characteristics that students appreciate more in their PhD advisor than the actual technical aspects of the job. In addition, uh, what they found was that there was a huge mismatch between what the students wanted in an advisor versus what they actually got in an advisor. Here's another figure from the, the article by Woolston. So on the flip side, if you have a, if you, so if you have a supportive advisor, it's great for your mental health. But on the flip side, there are a lot of bad behaviors or bad relationships between advisors and students. And in the same survey of 6,000 respondents, what they found was that over 20% of the respondents had, a, uh, had experienced discrimination or harassment during their PhD. And what they also found in this survey was that the most frequent perpetrators were their advisor. On the fig in the figure on the right, you can see some of the, the types of discrimination and harassment that these students have experienced. Okay, now we wouldn't have a complete discussion about mental health if we didn't talk about COVID-19. COVID-19 has exacerbated the situation. So again, coming back to these surveys of, of students, uh, this survey that was done in 2020 showed that 35% of undergraduate students and 32% of graduate and professional students screened positive for major depressive disorder, while 39% of undergraduate and graduate students screen positive for generalized anxiety disorder. These numbers are up from the numbers that I showed you earlier, at least in terms of the undergrad student mental health. Major depressive disorders and generalized anxiety disorder rates are more pronounced among low-income students, students of color, women, non-binary, women and non-binary students, LGBTQ students, and students who are caregivers. So let's come back to my personal experience. I had a number of risk factors. Um, I've listed those, uh, some, some of those up here on, on this slide, but I also had a number of protective factors. I had a great relationship with my PhD advisor. I had sufficient financial support. I wasn't paid great, but I was making a living. I was surviving um, as a grad student. And I'm white and I'm a US citizen. Now, in terms of my risk factors, the, the ones that I wanna point out as being sort of the most meaningful in terms of my own story and my own experience were that I had untreated mental illness and I experienced trauma as a PhD student. Now, what I wanna say from this slide is I don't want you to sort of compare yourself to me. I don't want you to say, well, my experiences are not as bad as Professor Jeffers's, so therefore I don't need to get help. I can tough it out. Okay, everybody has their own threshold for when they need to get help. And I encourage you to um, listen to yourself when, when you feel that sort of burnout, that, that, you know, that feeling of hopelessness um, that, that is causing you to, to not be able to do your work in the way that you would normally be able to. Okay, that's the thing that, that you wanna look for. Okay, so these are just some, this is just sort of one case. Um, one, one story, um, but, but your story is going to be unique. Okay, so let's talk about some lessons learned. Again, I'm speaking as a person with mental illness, not as a mental health professional. One of the things that I've learned with having mental illness is that if you're in crisis, seek help. If you're having thoughts of harming yourself or others, go to the psychiatric emergency room or call 911. If you're in a crisis, but it's not that dire, then seek help at CAPS or at the Engineering Care Center or find a private clinician or a therapist, okay? There are options out there for you. If you're not getting the proper treatment at the university, you can go elsewhere. Um, there are private practices out there. Um, 
So I, I want to give that as an option. But but if you're in crisis, don't wait. Just just seek help. The next thing I want to say is that there's no shame in getting help for mental health. You are not weak, defective, or any other bad thing that your brain tells you. There's no shame in going to therapy. It doesn't mean that you're crazy or that you're helpless or that you even necessarily have a mental illness. I'm of the mindset that therapy is good for anyone who wants to better themselves. We all have things that we can work on to improve ourselves. If you're having troubles academically, again, don't wait, seek help. Um, don't be afraid to talk with your academic advisor, whether you're an undergrad or a grad student. Um, your advisor should be able to point you to resources on campus. Um, in addition, if you go to the Care Center's website, you'll see that they have links to a lot of different resources, both for undergrad and grad students. Um, so take advantage of those resources. Arm yourself with skills to positively affect your mental health. Now, I'm not gonna tell you that attending a yoga session is gonna fix all of your problems, but there are some strategies that you can utilize that have been shown to generally improve your mental health. And I've listed some of those strategies here on this slide from a paper by Poole and Qualter from back in 2012. The strategies shown on this slide are tools that you can use to combat stressors in your life. Surround yourself with people who make you better. Again, school is an isolating process. PhD is a very isolating process. Make sure you stay connected with people. Um, if you aren't getting what you need from your advisor, then look elsewhere. Your advisor is only one person and they're not the only person. You can and should find others who can mentor and support you. Also, don't underestimate the importance of friends, peers, and family when it comes to mental health. If you need accommodations, don't be afraid to ask for them. A diagnosed mental illness is a recognized disability, and sometimes a simple accommodation can make all the difference. Now, the way that it works here at the University of Michigan is you go to the services uh, for students with disabilities office, you have to provide documentation that you have a condition and then they have this sort of standard menu of accommodations that they can provide you. What I want to say is that there, it's not a, a perfect fix. Um, it's woefully centered on undergraduate students, which is something that I'd like to change, but it's worth at least exploring if you can get some help to support you with your condition. Um, I'll give you an example. So this came up in conversation just the other day with a faculty member across campus. She said, the accommodation for anxiety is time and a half. Can you imagine taking that accommodation and trying to apply it to your prelim exam or your qualifying exam? So you get time and a half with a room with this intimidating group of professors. And you know, so it's, it's not one size fits all, but you know, it's, it's worth at least exploring. Take a leave of absence if you have to, but remember that it is always your decision to take a leave of absence. Nobody should tell you that you, know, you need to take a leave of absence. You do it on your own terms. And when doing so, weigh the pros and cons. I don't have a whole lot of advice because I don't have a whole lot of experience with this particular topic, but um, Rackham has a leave policy that you can look into. And I would say, just make sure that you talk with people, talk with professors, talk with students before you make that decision. Take time to work on you. So college and grad school is the best time to do this, in my opinion. Um, identify your weaknesses and begin to work on them. For example, I wouldn't have been able to interview for a faculty position at all if I hadn't worked on my social anxiety when I was a grad student. Structure your days. Routine is essential for good mental health. Wake up, work, eat, go to bed at the same time every day, or at least roughly the same time. Having a structured day is really important, especially when you don't have structure from classes. You know, so you're a PhD student and your day is sort of just work on research. You don't have a start time, you don't have an end time, you don't have meetings in between. It's just you and your research. Structure your day, okay? Create a schedule for yourself. 
it's going to make things a lot more manageable. Um, this is especially important if you're working remotely as well. So during COVID, a lot of students were taking classes online and trying to study and do all their homework in that one little square foot of their apartment. Um, you know, it's really hard to get all of your work done if you don't have some sort of structure to your day. Another piece of advice that I have is to give back. Um, take time to give back. Service is something that's been part of my life for as long as I can remember. Part of my recovery was volunteering for this organization called Fresh Start Clubhouse. It's a member-led organization that empowers people with mental illness. Fresh Start gave me purpose and allowed me to connect with people who had similar experiences with mental illness. Talking to people who had experienced psychosis made me feel not so alone. So even if you're struggling, I recommend that you find opportunities to volunteer, help others. It makes you feel good. It helps you build skills and it helps you build your resume. Okay, now I've got some tailored advice for uh, PhD students um, because I brought up a number of things and I don't wanna leave it hanging, okay? So we looked at the factors that affect student mental health and we saw that isolation was a, a big one. And the, the protective factor in that, that situation is if you're connected with the community in some way, it kind of helps you fight that isolation. So an easy fix would be, I recommend that you join a club or a community organization, or you volunteer, you find a way to get connected with other people. It doesn't have to be in your field of research. And in fact, that sometimes it's even better if it's not in your field of research. Um, I also brought up the student advisor relationship. I have a couple of slides on that. Um, the long hours, I have something coming up on that. And then uh, the stress, okay? So let's talk about student advisor relationships. Now, if you're not in grad school yet, this is easy. I can say, you know, personal characteristics matter more than field of expertise. Make sure your advisor's style is gonna be the, is gonna match the kind of learner that you are and interview students in the research group if possible. That doesn't fix things if you're already here, right? You're already teamed up with your advisor. And if you're having student advisor relationships, it's a very tricky situation to deal with. So I put this slide in here to address sort of the, the far end of the spectrum, which is faculty student abuse. Um, recognize the signs and seek help. What I'm talking about is if you have an advisor who's bullying you, manipulating you, doing coercing you to do something, controlling you, as well as blatant discrimination and harassment. I wanna point out that abuse and advisor-student relationships happens on every university campus. It happens in every field. It even happens here in the College of Engineering at the University of Michigan. So don't be afraid to reach out. Um, I don't have an easy solution for you, but there are people that you can talk to. Um, talk to other grad students and postdocs and try to normalize what's going on. Try to see, is this normal? My advisor's doing this. Um, other faculty in the department you can reach out to, especially somebody who's in a DEI position, a DEI lead or the chair of the DEI committee. Um, you can also reach out to the grad chair and the department chair, um, hopefully if you feel safe doing so. Um, in CEE, the contacts are listed here on the right of the slide. Um, I am one of those people, so feel free to, you know, if you're, if you're struggling with your advisor to, to reach out to me, I'm happy to talk with you. I do want to point out that there was a change in the Title IX policy, which means that nearly every faculty member is, a, is an individual with reporting obligations. So if we find out of a situation of uh, sexual or gender-based discrimination or harassment, we are obligated to report that to the Office of Equity, Civil Rights, and Title IX. I do want to also mention that this reporting only triggers an email to you asking if you want to follow up. So it's not like it causes anything bigger to happen, but that's sort of the, the, the situation is that if you're talking to faculty in a department, it's not completely confidential. If you want a confidential resource, I recommend that you reach out to the ombudsperson. And I've included his information on the top right of the slide. Um, the ombudsperson for the university for both undergrad and grad students is Tom Laker. And you can email that 
so send an email to the, the address there and set up an appointment with him and, and just sort of see, you know, is this normal? What are my ways out? What are my options? You know, things like that. So it's an unbiased person who can sort of help you navigate that difficult situation. I will mention that uh, Tom Laker gave a presentation to the DEI leads uh, just a couple weeks ago. And I asked him, I said, do you see graduate students and what are their main concerns? And he said, the number one concern that I get from grad students is when they have this sort of advisor student relationship problem that they're trying to navigate. Um, so, so it's not something that's, that's super uncommon. Okay, uh, I'm gonna tell my faculty colleagues to turn their heads because I'm gonna say something that's probably not uh, popular uh, amongst them, but work hard, but protect your time. School doesn't have to take up 24 seven of your life. You deserve a life outside of school. And if you have a life outside of school, you're gonna be more productive in your research. So work out a schedule with your advisor that makes sense. In my group, my students mainly work a nine to five with an occasional you know, weekend work as needed if you know, we're facing a tight deadline or something like that. I don't expect my students to be in the lab at hours in the, the late evening. I don't expect them to be there over the weekends. You know, if they, if they want to, that's fine, that's their decision, but I don't sort of force them to, to work when, at, at times when I'm not even working myself. Um, if you have to work weekends, find a day or two during the week that you can take off. There's no written rule that you should be at your advisor's beck and call 24 seven. Okay, so let me give some advice to the faculty in the room now. Um, I want you to uh, you think about your role as a PhD advisor and think back to those characteristics of an ideal PhD advisor that I mentioned on a couple slides earlier and try to emulate those. That's what's really meaningful to the relationship that you're forming with your student. I also recommend that faculty talk with their students about expectations regarding work hours so that there is no ambiguity, so that everybody knows sort of when you're expected to be in the lab, when do you get time off, when do you get vacation time, you know? Those kinds of things are just sort of not talked about and we just expect you to work whenever. That's, that's not um, a good situation from a mental health perspective. Um, for faculty, I also uh, encourage you to participate in the MORE mentoring program through Rackham uh, and formulate a mentoring plan with your students. Um, and then advocate for structural changes to create a more inclusive environment. So the more people who are sort of on board with creating an inclusive environment, the more likely we're able to bring about structural changes that are gonna benefit everybody. Okay, uh, now coming to teaching, because I know that, that some faculty had questions about sort of teaching and, and, and how can we be more uh, supportive in, in the classroom. Um, my recommendation is to be as flexible as you can with deadlines. And this of course has to be done within reason. If you're teaching a large undergrad class with a couple hundred students, it's really hard to be flexible with deadlines. Um, but having said that, for, for people who struggle with mental illness or who are struggling with mental health in general, um, they, they sometimes miss deadlines and students are very poor at managing their time anyway. And so they may, you know, oh, I, for, I, I was working on this, so I, I, I didn't think about this until it was too late and so forth. So like uh, those, those situations are not students being lazy. Those students are situations who are just struggling to be independent. And um, so, so I, I recommend being as flexible as possible. I also recommend considering untimed exams, um, and I'll explain to you why. Uh, so there are a lot of students on campus who have disabilities. There are a lot of students on campus who have undocumented disabilities. And so those students have a condition that is preventing them to participate at their full capacity, um, but they, they it's not documented, and so they aren't getting the time and a half on an exam, right? So to level the playing field, what I do is I give students, you know, if, I, if I'm giving a, a one hour exam, I'll give the students a full two hours to work on it. I'll design the, exam to, design the exam to fit within the one hour time period, but everybody has that extended time. And the students who get time and a half, if you may be worried that like, oh, it's gonna take them three hours to finish that two hour exam, 
But they don't need it actually, because they only need the time and the half. Um, so, so almost nobody extends it beyond that two hour time period. And I found that performance on my exams um, has improved as a result of doing that. Um, if a student isn't attending class or submitting homework assignments, be proactive and reach out to them. Um, this is something that I try to do in my classes. If I notice that a student isn't participating, I'll send them an email and just say, hey, you know, I was just wondering what's going on. Um, is there something that I can do to help you get caught up with your work? Um, more times than not, the student will be honest and say that there's so probably something major going on in their life. Um, and, and so then you're able to work with them to get them caught up and, and um, on their way. Um, note that if you're reaching out to students individually, you should also be prepared to make referrals to the care center and to CAPS and whoever else, okay? Because the student may bring up something that sounds like, you know, hey, they're really struggling with mental health. Maybe they need to see a counselor. You should also respect a student's decision to share or not share about mental health issues. There is a lot of stigma around mental illness and a student may not feel comfortable disclosing to you that they have mental illness um, or they may feel comfortable disclosing. I notice with the younger generations, they're, they're more open about it. They, they don't have any hesitancy in saying, hey, I have condition X, you know? Um, so uh, just, just be respectful and be mindful, don't, but don't pray. Okay, this one applies to everyone in the room, everybody on Zoom. Um, eat, hydrate, sleep, go to your doctor's appointments, exercise, avoid alcohol and drugs. This is just basic self-care. Take care of yourself and your mental health is going to improve. Okay, so I also want you to know that things are changing for the better here at the University of Michigan. The administration knows that students are struggling, especially due to the pandemic. And they're committing resources to improving student mental health. The Student Mental Health and Innovative Approaches Review Committee looked at student mental health across the board and it sparked new initiatives like Wolverine Wellness, which offers um, trainings and uh, coaching to units on campus related to mental health, as well as the Collegiate Recovery Program which supports students recovering from drug and alcohol use disorders. At the grad level, Rackham has formed a standing committee on mental health and well being that addresses structural changes to support graduate student mental health. This is a new committee as of this year. I currently serve on it. There are other faculty, staff, and students who are on this committee, but they're aware that graduate student mental health is a real problem and we need to be doing something about it. Um, and then the last bullet point here is an initiative that I'm trying to start here at the University of Michigan. So I told you about Fresh Start Clubhouse and how meaningful it was to my own recovery. I'm not a member of Fresh Start. I just volunteer there. I'm president of their governing board, but you know, I, I, I consider myself to be sort of an affiliate member. Um, but I think that we can also apply that concept of a clubhouse to the university. The clubhouse is a peer led community that um, seeks to improve um, mental health and address things like transportation and housing and uh, employment and schooling and so forth. So what I want to do is to try to create something um, that's going to take that clubhouse model and apply it here at the University of Michigan. And I've been in contact with the director of CAPS and the director of uh, UHS and the director of Wolverine Wellness. And so we're meeting to um, discuss this possibility. These initiatives are fairly new, uh, many are not even underway, but they demonstrate that student mental health is on the radar of the university administration and that change is happening. Okay, so we'll wrap things up and then uh, we'll move to um, a question and answer session. Um, basically, I shared my story with you today because I want you to feel like you're not alone if you're struggling in any way with mental health. The data show but many students are struggling as well. I mean, you saw it in, in Berkeley, 50% of their PhD students who responded to that survey said, I'm, I'm feeling symptoms of depression. The university does have supports in place and I've highlighted some of those to you here in this presentation, 
Um, I encourage you to utilize those supports. And please also don't hesitate to seek treatment off campus if you find that the resources on campus are not sufficient. In my case, it was a long and arduous road to recovery. It took me years, but I've emerged stronger and more, a stronger and more resilient person. And for those of you who may be wondering sort of what happened with that second child that you were trying to get pregnant with and then you sort of lost your mind and had this whole mental health journey. Well, we actually adopted uh, her, the one in front, uh, from foster care. And then just this past year, we adopted her sister, who's the baby in that picture. Um, so now I've got three kids. It's a whole new journey. Um, okay, so I'll finish up here. Um, my contact info is on this slide. Feel free to email me if, if you're, you know, if there's something from this presentation that really struck you, feel free to email me. You can find me on the web as well. Um, I'm now tweeting on mental health stuff. So you can find me on Twitter too.